Um, my name is Monica and I'll be kicking off the webinar, um, introducing my coworkers. Um, Harry is joining us from Microsoft and Pablo as well from Plain Concepts. Thank you. So as I said, um, we will have Harry, who's a data and AI solution specialist at Microsoft, kick off the event as this is joined with Microsoft. Um, my name is Monica and I'm your uh, UK growth strategy lead. And we also have Pablo, um, our GM and um, data lead. Um, after Harry conveys a few words, I will be doing a quick introduction of the agenda and pass it on to Pablo to continue the webinar. To you, Harry. OK, perfect. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, for bearing with us there. So yeah, as Monica said, my name's Harry Turner. I'm the data and AI lead for the legal industry at Microsoft. Uh, hopefully you've spoken to uh, s some of you on the webinar before as well. Um, I'll keep it brief before I hand over back to the plain concept guys, but I just wanted to obviously personally thank you first and foremost for making the time to, to, to join today's webinar. Um, I'm really excited about the work that we're doing uh, in partnership with plain concepts in, in the legal industry. I think there's huge um, opportunity for us to, to be working in partnership with, with you all. Um, the, the purpose of the webinar really is in essence to help start customers at the very start of their data strategy as well. So helping helping shape that, harnessing the data within your organization to transform the way that you work. Um, whether that's gaining quicker and richer insights out of the data that you've got, improvement in data quality, or simply modernizing and moving away from some of the legacy solutions that we sometimes see that are in place and, and harnessing more and more of the, the power of Azure and the cloud. Um, plain concepts, I mean, make no mistake, are our trusted partner in this space when it comes to data, analytics and AI. Uh, we've done some really great work, as I said, with plain concepts already in the in the industry. We've been help, helping UK firms with their digital transformation, working on some really, really exciting use cases as well. So whether that's forecasting, uh, settlement probability, case matter profitability, and even starting to identify data sets now that already exist within the firms, but being able to then flip that and to create new re revenue streams or products and services off the back of that as well. So a huge opportunity, I think, for, for you all to start harnessing the data that already exists within your organization. Um, so with that said, I'll hand over back to Plain Concepts. I'm conscious of time, so but I know we have some exciting offers and next steps towards the end of the webinar as well. So I, I hope to speak to you all soon. Thank you. Thank you kindly, Harry, for the kind words. Um, just one minute about Plain Concepts. Um, we've been around for 14 years. Um, we have offices around the world. One is based in London, so happy to meet locally, host you at our office or travel to your location. Um, we have end-to-end -end capabilities really in the Microsoft stack, but we do focus on data projects. Uh, we have uh, 13 MVPs on staff. Uh, AI data is our lifeline. Um, some of our customers you might have heard of, WPP, CBRE, Lido, and actually Microsoft as well. Um, like Harry mentioned, we've been working with law firms for a few years, so we're really excited to put this our first webinar. Um, a brief word about ourselves. Pablo is our partner in Plain Concepts, and he's also leading the UK operations and the global data team. And myself um, spent some time at Microsoft, Amazon, and I'm now the UK business director. So I'll be your point of contact and strengthening our local presence in the UK. So with that, um, I will let Pablo take over um, just really quickly on the agenda. We thought given that there's a mixed audience between technical and business roles, we will be going through some of the trends that we've noticed, the challenges and touch on the technology applied, the projects we have done and guidance on how we see the data strategy and the data state to be handled moving forward. And of course, Q&A at the end, but really this is an open conversation so if you have any questions type them in i will be monitoring the q a chat box um, and i will be pausing pablo to address them you can stop us at any time or just um, enter your questions at the end thank you very much and looking forward to the webinar pablo we can can't you, hear you can you hear me now okay so yes uh, so thanks a lot, Harry. Thanks a lot, Monica, for the for the introductions, and of course, thanks a lot to all of you for coming for this 
45 minutes, 50 minutes. Apologies again for the delay. I'm going to try to to go directly to the to the interesting parts of the of the session. But first of all, I think it's interesting to to talk about something, and it's basically the current trend, not just in legal firms, uh, but in all of the customers we have been working with uh, for the last couple of years. I think it's prevalent. We all know that uh, that AI is something that's uh, definitely uh, in the interests of most of the business. Actually, these metrics that you can see here from Garner are quite impressive and they relate quite well with what we are seeing right now in terms of, of interests and adoption uh, by our current customers, even though we have a little bit of a biased uh, uh, understanding of the picture because we have a dedicated, well, actually a couple of dedicated teams to AI. So so in total, in our organization, uh, the number of our customers that uh, go for AI projects uh, is, is definitely very, very, very sizable uh, percentage of, of the total. Uh, but in order to, to go for the very interesting use cases that that we can do uh, through AI and landing this a little bit on on our um, interest here on this webinar on the law sector on the lower space we have been doing uh, I think fantastic stuff and in both traditional approaches is uh, to forecasting and classification classifying uh, the track that's going to be appropriate for a specific uh, case classifying or doing a, a document analysis to identify the sensitiveness of the document or whether this document contains PII or not, or doing an automated selection of the best cases to present to, to, to the court. Uh, all this is super uh, exciting. Uh, it's where the innovation lies, but the bad news is that to get here, we first need to make sure that we have data. And we need to make sure that the data we have uh, is usable uh, and it's of uh, good enough quality at least. Uh, actually, quality is a pretty interesting topic that can also lead to additional AI uh, developments, but we need to have a solid base where we can have some data, we can use it, uh, we can use it effectively, we can use it securely and also compliantly. Uh, so even though we are going to uh, discuss at length, uh, some super exciting use cases on AI. I think it's uh, important that we all understand that the first thing we need to have in place is proper proper uh, data strategy. It, it's not just AI, it's a data strategy. It's making sure that I have a platform where I can have my data, all my data assets uh, in a way that can be governed, in a way that can be secured, and in a way that these data assets can make uh, can be made available to the specific use cases that we want to build with. So this creates a set of um, a set of challenges, uh, a set of challenges that's what I want to focus uh, first. And then we will talk about how to solve and overcome these challenges. So number one is the data storage is where I'm going to be having this data, where, where this data is going to be uh, lying and how is it going to be available for my different um, for my different use cases. And uh, here I want to talk also about uh, how we normally work with the data. Normally we we work uh, and in this industry uh, in a very reactive approach. So uh, an example would be having a, a customer that calls our call center or reaches out through our inboxes. Uh, and then we have someone um, maybe uh, in the in the parallel space uh, doing the data entry of, of the case then we have the fear owner working and then we have uh, hopefully a good resolution for the for our customer and that's normally where the analytics happens uh, our vision here is that we want to have analytics all around and we have to ha and we want to have automation and ai all around in all the phases of the projects from the very same moment we get the call or we get the intake of the of the customer in whatever form it is uh, to the data entry to the actual work and to the and to the analysis once the, the issue is solved and to move to this space again we have to have a, a proper foundation um, working on on 
law firms uh, has a set of challenges. Obviously, your millage by, might vary, but something that we have encountered in our own experiences, first of all, uh, massive amount of data segregation. Normally this happens because of merger or acquisitions, which is a, a natural way of growing the, the, the firms, but also because um, in, in this space, we find a lot of off-the-shelf products that use their own specific proprietary systems for storage, and they need to be integrated with the rest of the systems. And in order to have a holistic view of all these different data sources and, and bring them for reporting or advanced analytics, uh, we need to, to uh, develop specific uh, solutions that normally ends up being uh, a bit of a silos in a sense. And uh, actually, this is something that we see a lot uh, in, in the industry. We have a lot of data sources. We have sources for financial, sometimes even many systems, many different systems for finance, many different systems for case management. Um, same thing happens for for the engagement with media through through adverts, etc. Uh, but we need to have uh, a consolidated view that then we can do our activate our use cases, whether they are again analytical or advanced analytics, or even whether they are just operational, but having all the data around uh, the company available. So through history, and I know you already know this very well, so I'm going to screen through this very quickly. But we have done a lot of different approaches is to try to, to uh, overcome this problem and try to, to be able to use the data from different sources, from these different silos uh, to provide, for example, reporting capabilities. Uh, we have went through uh, some more naive approaches is like uh, departmental reports targeting directly the different uh, data sources. Uh, but this is going to create uh, problems in terms of the definition of the KPIs or the definition of the metrics. Maybe the definition of uh, KPI in finance needs to be used in marketing. But since we are only going for the data and not for the definition of the of the KPI, uh, this will end up being implemented in a different way in all the different departments of the, of the organization, uh, which obviously it's uh, far from ideal. Uh, I think as you all know, we have the mythical data warehouse, uh, many years ago as the proponent for the single version of truth in the organization. But as well, probably we all know that data warehousing projects very seldom lead to, to a successful uh, project because they take a lot of time trying to have a single view that uh, conforms to all the, the, the business. And even more importantly, if a small tiny change happens in a small part of the organization, uh, this needs to be taken into account by the large data warehouse as a whole. So this normally requires changing ETLs in very different places, changing definitions, and uh, this makes the development of data warehousing solutions uh, pretty challenging. And to overcome this, gain uh, another iteration, data marts were born, data marts were just a small uh, kind of departmental uh, data warehouse. So when we needed to make some change to finance, it would only impact finance. If we needed to make some change in operations, it would constrain the, 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 the scope of the changes to, to operations, uh, which made it easier uh, to handle. But again, we had some issues mostly with how to handle shared data across different data marts like dimensionals, uh, sorry, dimensions like um, customers or accounts, things like that. Um, and to make things even a little bit more complex, uh, the new world requires new uh, ways of working with the data. I, when we thought we have found uh, some stability with the data marts, now we have uh, to deal with the real-time data. And when we are talking about real-time data, we are not just talking about uh, sensor data or things like that. Real-time data can also be just the Twitter feed or uh, from our users uh, or our customers. Um, we also have to work with, with volatile data structures, data structures that change a lot because we are right now talking to a lot of APIs for integration with different products. And as probably many of you have expected, uh, they tend to change and the format of the outputs tend to change. Uh, and we need to uh, adapt our loading processes, our ETLs, 
uh, for these uh, for these uh, changes in the schema, and we need to protect ourselves from this. But also, we have new data structures like documents, like media, like video, like images. Uh, another very interesting point and uh, something that we are seeing over and over and very much into the lowest space because of the um, adoption into cloud, it's normally uh, a little bit slower and more phased than in other customers. Uh, we have hybrid scenarios where we have on-prem and cloud and sometimes on-prem and multi-cloud. And we need to make sure that however we, we work with the data, uh, we are able to understand what data sets do we have on prem? What data sets do we have on cloud and how they are connected? And lastly, uh, and this is not just to follow with the AI and machine learning hype, but actually uh, for enabling AI projects, for enabling uh, machine learning models uh, in production, you need some special set of requirements that normally a traditional relational database is not going to 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 be enough and i'm talking about versioning of the data for the training uh, data sets for the specific versions of each model uh, the lineage uh, between the data that's been used for training and the operational data these kind of, co on con of concepts are really 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 uh, first class citizens in the in the new world and we need to make sure that whatever data strategy we devise whatever tools we use uh, all these items are taken care of. So to to cater with this new world, um, the concept of data lake, appear, data lakes are not anything new. Actually, they, they appear for the first time in uh, 2010, if I'm not uh, if I'm not mistaken. So definitely, by any means, they are not anything new. Um, but they enable some very interesting ways of working with the data and being more agile in creating new use cases for the for the company in creating new uh, applications to, that will interact with the data. We will talk about the data lake a little bit later when we go to the strategy. But this is just uh, an overview I wanted to to add here to isolate and, and clarify what's a data warehouse, data mart and a data lake. We will get into this uh, a little bit later. This was the first challenge. Uh, where do I store my data and how can I work with my data? Uh, the second challenge is controlling the access to my resources. And when we think about access control, the first thing that comes to, to mind is, OK, I want to secure or protect my data. And next, maybe I can say, OK, but I want to protect any data assets, maybe documents. Uh, these documents might, rel might be living on a SharePoint or might be living on an uh, external file system and I need to protect them as well in the same, uh, in the same, using the same approach. If we think more about this, we can also think on all the resources we need to protect, like my machine learning models. I need to make sure that when I put into production a machine learning model, this is protected, not just in development time, but in production and execution time. Uh, so only the users that can use it are able to see it, to access to it, etc. This is what we normally think when we talk about access control, but there is a very, very important thing that we normally don't think about, which is the identity providers. When we work in, in Azure, in Microsoft's cloud, normally we work with an identity provider, which is uh, the Azure Active Directory. This is a mechanism that connects to your Active Directory to uh, handle the identity of the users that are going to interact with the different cloud resources and the data assets uh, and the models and everything on the platform. And this is very good when our um, when our systems are made to serve the internal company, the internal needs. But sometimes we need to think about other external identity providers, identity providers like Google IDs like Twitter, like LinkedIn uh, logins. Why this is relevant? Why this matters to us and why this matters in the lowest space? Well, let's consider that I have in whatever mechanism I have, whether it's a data lake or just files running around or SQL, whatever, I have some data assets, my data state, and I have some applications that work on this data state. Uh, some applications are going to be internal, purely internal. Here, my corporate BI, I don't want to 
provide access to external firms or external users to this. But if I have a very exciting uh, project for, for um, uh, simplifying the due diligence process, doing automatic analysis of contracts. Um, well, I can start thinking this might have a value by itself. I can create a new revenue stream to my company just by selling this product, just by selling this service. So something that became, uh, that originally was an application, became a service that I can sell. But if I want to sell a service to a, another firm or to the end users like a case management app that has a, a mobile phone so we can give this application to our end users and they can update their details and this gets automatically into the case management app. Uh, what I want to avoid is creating just a new um, infrastructure that works with a different access mechanism based on something that's not my identity server, or sorry, on, on not my Azure Active Directory. Uh, because obviously it's out of the question, I will not give access to my Active Directory to the end users, and I will not give access to my Active Directory um, to my um, to my partners or other firms. So what we do in this case is we can use identity providers, external identity providers using identity server, uh, which is a uh, um, open source Microsoft technology uh, to enable these scenarios. The technology here is not relevant, it's not important, even though I will talk about this a little bit later. But the important thing here is that if we think about this in a, in a strategic way, not project by project, we can define a way of connecting different identity providers so we can enable internal projects to be consumed externally in a secure way, but by passing the, the or federating the identity to external uh, um, identity providers. This is a very, very interesting scenario. This is something we are using in quite a few customers already, and I will get into the details of this a little bit later. Let's move to the next challenge, which is compliance. This is, of course, something that we all have in, in, in our minds, especially with our friend GDPR and, and other uh, regulatory frameworks we have around. So first of all, let's start with something very simple, which is the data segregation. Uh, it's a quite common requirement if uh, we are talking about um, a firm operating in multiple um, jurisdictions that we need to comply with geographical segregation requirements. Uh, one very good example is uh, Germany data and German special policies in terms of HR uh, data that cannot leave the country even the compute cannot leave the country. So we need to make sure that the data can be spread globally through different geographical regions and the compute associated or models uh, associated to this need also to be living on the specific geographical location. This is probably the, the, the this is one, this, the, the, the more, uh, the challenge that's easy to solve because, well, if we are talking about cloud, if we go to the cloud, then we can just deploy it wherever, uh, whatever in our case, Azure has data centers. So that uh, simplifies our life quite considerably. Second one is PII classification. So sometimes I'm, uh, I, well, obviously I need to be aware whether my data contains some kind of personal identifiable information in it. Uh, and sometimes when I'm defining a new system, Greenfield system, I can put in place some mechanisms to analyze the data that's been intaked into the platform uh, with a machine learning model that can uh, look for names, places, uh, addresses, phone numbers, email addresses, anything or medical information, anything that can be considered PII. And this can create a trigger that tags the data automatically when I'm ingesting the data. That's uh, that's actually very, very interesting. There's, uh, I've seen approaches and we've made approaches in customers, both using off the shelf products and both using also um, bespoke solutions, bespoke models for the PII classification when there is some specific classifications that, that need to be made. Um, but this normally doesn't present that much of a challenge. Uh, a little bit more challenging is the personal data identification on the legacy data, 
once we have uh, some data already loaded in the platform and we need to classify what we have and this is a bit more challenging because normally the size itself is going to prove a little bit of a, of a challenge because uh, the, the querying to identify this personal data uh, will require uh, well, first of all to have some natural language processing capabilities so normally we are going to be talking here about python r or some statistical language or language with statistical capabilities and not just pure SQL normally and also because there are some very very good models already written for that uh, and secondly we will need something that can scale out this query for large volumes of data but in addition to this if we are going to be working on tagging data that's uh, legacy we need some way of understanding which data do we have in the system and also to be able to tag the data that we have in the system. So some sort of data catalog is, is necessary. Uh, if we also talk uh, about complex data retention policies, uh, we add a little bit of complexity to this. We uh, are talking here about ex scenarios like, uh, and again, in, in, this is something that probably all of you know very well in this, in this sector, uh, which is the retention uh, the maximum retention I can have of, of the data. So, for example, five years since the closure of the case or seven years since the closure of the case uh, or more complex rules like uh, X years after the closure of the case, except whether the case that the, 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 the claimant is, uh, is uh, underage. And we need to, to wait until this claimant is, is an adult. Uh, this kind of things requires not just a data catalog, but it requires some sort of master data because I need to know this information of the specific person, of the specific client or, or claimant. Uh, so this is, as you can see here, more challenging, but this is cross to all the data in my platform because these retention policies can affect to all the data from different systems in my platform. And also this um, creates some new, let's say challenges in the form of how I'm going to be deleting data. I'm going to be deleting the data uh, as a hard delete or just a logical delete or I am just going to be masking the data and probably most interesting of all these challenges is the last one. I can have this data deleted on a central repository, on a SQL Server database or on a data lake as I'm going to be showing you in a minute, but what happens with the third party systems? What happens with my CRM? What happens with my case management system? Uh, what happens with any external system that's not going to be living inside this data state. It's an external actor. But if I want to comply with the regulatory constraints that force me to um, delete the data after a certain retention period has, has happened, I need to make sure I can communicate with this third party system and issue a command so they can delete the, the relevant data that this needs to happen from a centralized state. So we are starting to see here that we need to make and tackle these things, these challenges from, a, again, in a strategic point of view, not a tactical one. I cannot do this in a system by system basis. I need to have kind of an orchestration model for this data retention. And then this orchestration is going to communicate to all the data systems in my, in my uh, data state. And lastly, the right to be forgotten is very similar, but it adds something, adds something to, the, to the equation, which is I need to be able to provide the user, whether it is through a web UI or whether it is just a list I'm sending on an email, but I need to be able to provide them with a list of all the data my firm has of them. Uh, this is by law. I need to, 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 to be able, and I would like you to think uh, what would take to your firms right now if I, as a customer, if I, as a client, call you and ask you, I want to have the list of all the data points you have related to me, because that's definitely quite a challenge. So, um, in terms of, we could talk a lot uh, more about uh, compliance and GDPR. I'm sure probably at the end of the session, we will have some questions about this. More than happy to, to go through them. Uh, but I think this summarizes a little bit what we are talking about here. Lastly, document data. Uh, when we want to handle data that's not purely tabular, uh, immediately a, an amazing world of opportunities appears. 
Uh, we are doing things in customers uh, from due diligence processes, uh, simplification, document classification. We do this a lot in many, many customers. So uh, in one case, we can identify uh, invoices, bills, uh, technical manuals. In other uh, case or other scenario, we can identify uh, emails, types of emails, uh, queries, um, complaints, things like that. Um, and having a system that does this automatically is not something new. There has been uh, for many years so that there has been um, off the shelf products. But one of the things that we are seeing is that when we want to work with document data and NLP, one thing that's super important and these uh, products normally cannot uh, cover is the ability to use your own embeddings. And I don't want to get a technical here again at the Q&A uh, time. Feel free to, to come back to me and ask me about this. Uh, but uh, in a nutshell, uh, working with data related to um, healthcare in a, in a specific case uh, is going to be very, very, very different to working with data related to a case which is uh, regarding finance or, or banking or real estate. Uh, the nuances in the language are different. Uh, the way the documents are uh, written are different. And we need to make sure that our semantic models, the semantic models that we use, cater for these differences. And this is where bespoke projects instead of off the shelf product uh, make sense. Uh, and we can talk about more of these cases and we will do at the end of the presentation. Uh, but the thing here is that if we want to work with this kind of projects, uh, we need to make sure that we find a way of working with the documents uh, as a first class citizen. Normally the documents right now are stored in either in a file share in our infrastructure or in an Office 365, but they are not part of the same data assets. Once we have a data platform where we can have uh, tabular data documents, we have the storage and compute for working with them indistinctly. Uh, and it's, they are all secure under the same security model. And if I change the security of something, I don't have to go to a SQL server and change permissions to some tables and then go to a Office 365 uh, library and change in that SharePoint library uh, the permissions to match things like that, we want to have this all unified. So once we have data platform, once we have the appropriate AI models for the classifier, for the embeddings, etc., uh, it's only a matter of having some kind of workspace management, whether it's again Office 365 or a custom bespoke web UI to enable the users to work on this. But I think the key here is that it's in our experience, very, very important to have it all in the same data platform and not in a myriad of off-the-shelf products lying around our our um, our um, premises or, or cloud um, estate. So we have talked about certain challenges. So obviously, they are not all the challenges we have found this, this couple of years in, in the low sector, but I think they are quite relevant to, or probably the most relevant to all the firms. Uh, we talk about data strategy, and here what I want to make a key point of is that it's very important to have a strategy, not to work on a pilot proof of concept and then to the another one and then to another one and then to another one. And the reason being is that even though we all follow that that approach, um, if you go in a POC by POC basis, you end up repeating the same steps over and over. The data intake how to bring the data into the system, uh, the creating the infrastructure for training your models, creating the infrastructure for storing the APIs to do the inference on the models, creating the infrastructure uh, for doing the exploratory data analysis with my data bricks or, or whatever. Uh, and you are repeating these steps uh, several times. And actually every time we, we do this, we run the risk of doing them under a different security framework, under a different security constraints, not having a single version of the security. And very importantly, we also uh, lose the track of how many POCs we have. Because let me ask you a question, and, and I, I think this is a very, very interesting question. Uh, what was the last time you deleted a POC 
on your Azure subscription or even on premises? When was the last time that you deleted something? Deleting something is something that's terrifying to all of us. It's like, okay, maybe someone is using it. Maybe we have not finished with the POC. Uh, and it's not, even though technically it's super simple, obviously and it's one of the benefits of, of uh, the cloud. Actually doing it requires a little bit of, of uh, governance. And for that, uh, we, we, when we work with our customers and when we build our platform, one of the focus, one of the key things was making sure that we could create the use cases in an agile way. That means that the use cases, whether it is a POC, whether it is a full on product that's going to be living for years, whether it is a production product that's going to be a very minimal machine learning classifier that's going to only going to be in the business for one month or two months, but it's full production, uh, we can delete it afterwards very easily. So that's the, the kind of things we wanted to ensure when we are uh, creating a platform that allows for this agile development of use cases. In addition to that, uh, again, whether you use a platform such as ours or you create your own platform, a key thing is making sure that um, when you solve your data governance and GDPR or compliance uh, challenges, you don't do it in a one-off way. You provide a mechanism that all your, what we call the client applications or the use cases are going to share through all the, through all the data assets. Uh, that includes single data catalog, whether you have the data in multiple locations, uh, obviously secure and with uh, granular visibility, single security model, the capabilities for archival and retention and the right to be forgotten that we were talking about earlier and something that enables your platform not to delete the data that's living on the platform but also to communicate these deletions to orchestrate the deletions for the external third party systems as well and lastly i think what we discussed earlier having a pretty solid identity management that can rely on external identities and external identity providers uh, if you want to have the opportunity of use one of your services, one and the talent of your team building an AI model for forecasting of, of the settlement of a case or for the classification of the track of a case uh, or for the contract close or client detection. If you want to enable this as a separate business model, as a separate service that then you can sell and you need to do it after the work is done, uh, that's a challenge. It's way simple if you have a platform that enables that from the from the get go. So we obviously over the last few years have been working on on a data platform, and actually what I'm telling you and sharing with you right now is part of the learnings of the last almost five years in building uh, the data platform for different verticals, different industries. It's called Sidra Data Platform. After the session, feel free to, to send me emails from information or just go to sidra.dev and you have the documentation there. But in a nutshell, I'm going to be very quick on, on this. It's a platform that enables you to have data lake. I'm not going to get into the technical aspects, but an area where you can just put your data. And actually the data is, get, uh, is moved into the data lake automatically by the, by the platform because the ETL process, the data movement is automated always. It's created programmatically. This enables you to create very quickly with uh, basically a command line uh, new use cases. Each of these use cases use the same security model to access the data lake and bring the data. Uh, use the uh, the same mechanisms for the data catalog, for the data lineage. And very interestingly also, we have uh, the computation of the costs, the operational costs, the, the OPEX, the cost of running the platform on Azure, it's imputed differently for each of the, of the specific client applications. So you can track the cost of the core system and the, the cost of each of the applications independently. So you can surcharge it to the specific departments. And obviously some set of shared services uh, like again, this data catalog identities, the machine learning uh, model serving platform, etc., real time capabilities, <clears throat> and so on. I'm not going to get into the, a lot of details on how this is built because actually there are several flavors. The only interesting thing here is that all the what we call the storage area, the data storage units, which is what we could call the data lake itself, uh, is a reusable piece that by configuration can be 
we can have several created as many as we want in different data regions. So this allows uh, in a matter of minutes to have uh, a new storage location available that's going to store not just the data, but the models related to these apps. Uh, so the compute is going to be stored as well. So all the GDPR requirements in terms, not just of data storage, but also ensuring that when I'm training a model, the data doesn't move to another region, et cetera, is going to be taken care of automatically as well as the security and so on. So not going to get again into the details, uh, just very quickly, the platform can intake automatically uh, data, whether it's tabular data or document data or video or, or, or images, um, and it's going to all form part of the same catalog. Uh, uh, they are all first class citizens. We have a knowledge store that allows to enrich both document and tabular data uh, with translations, with classifications uh, automatically as part of the intake process. We have a mechanism to create these use cases, the applications, whether they are POCs or again, full blown applications uh, with uh, identity management, cost attribution, and the most important thing, a consistent model. All of them, uh, even though they can use different technologies, they are basically uh, open Asia research groups where you can use your own uh, data storage uh, mechanisms, your own compute mechanisms, uh, your own custom code or APIs, but they use the same security models uh, to bring data from the data lake, uh, the same data catalog for the apps as well, etc. In terms of security and compliance, yes? Apologies to interrupt. We have a question that I was uh, going to let you answer. Sure, please go for it. So the question is, how do we deal with law firms current trend of moving their DMS to proprietary so a vendor cloud platform like iManage Cloud? Um, this automatically creates separate silos of data as these clouds will be separate from a firm owned cloud tenancy. Well, uh, one of the things that can be done and actually this could be a pretty, pretty lengthy discussion around how to how to architect this, uh, but by the way, it's a very good uh, uh, question. Um, when we are talking about the different data storage units, uh, one specific data storage unit uh, can be um, per tenant. You can create, even though they can be on the same um, geographical region, they can be a way of implementing multi-tenancy. Uh, it's not my preferred approach because you can implement multi-tenancy in a platform like this uh, just by security and permissions, but sometimes customers ask for physical isolation. So this way we create specific resource groups with physical isolations. Now, if you go back to the, to the definition of what a DSU is, the DSU at the current moment in time is in storage based on, on data lake Gen 2 storage and Databricks for compute. Uh, this is not the only kind of DSUs we have. We're right now working with a firm in, in healthcare industry in the States, uh, and they are using a protocol called FEAR that's, uh, you, uh, that's storing the data in Cosmos. So this changes a little bit. We are also working with, uh, um, well, um, this is something that is still not public uh, in, in our roadmap, but we are working with, uh, um, um, uh, sorry, uh, with uh, SQL Data Warehouse or the new version of uh, SQL Data Warehouse as a storage layer. So the thing is that this can be tailor made to the specific uh, compute requirements, obviously with some development effort. So if the specific requirement is to uh, change the storage and compute as part of the DSU that is going to serve to one specific tenant, that can be done. Now, is that a good idea? That will merit a longer discussion because that's not my favorite or, or the approach I would take, but probably that will take a lot of time for, for, for this session. So uh, definitely open to, I'm opening my email or a Teams meeting or whatever to discuss this at length. So going forward, we were talking about the use cases. Uh, we were talking about security and compliance. So everything we were talking about uh, at some uh, point is is considered in the in the platform from automatic PII detection, both using standard models and our models, identity management with the identity server, etc. 
shared data catalog and anomaly detection on the intake process to identify when uh, a data process, a data load process is taking place. And suddenly today I'm receiving way less data or way more validation errors than I was doing in the past. This gets notifications sent automatically, etc. So I'm not going to get too much time on this again because you have the information docs.sidra.dev and sidra.dev. Uh, just wanted to, to show you how we are doing this. We are doing this in several law firms and many other verticals. Uh, and the important bit here is whether you use a product like Cedar or not. My very strong advice is don't do your projects um, in isolation. Uh, I think it's quite clear at this stage that as Garner was saying at the beginning of the session, uh, we are all shifting towards uh, data projects, using the data way more than we were doing before. And for that, we need to have a solid strategy and some sort of platform, whether it's made of different pieces already existing and different products, but we need some sort of hard or soft platform uh, to provide the means of creating use cases quickly in an agile way. Uh, this is our approach. We are super happy with it, but that's not the point. The point is the global strategy that you are planning to adopt. So I'm not going to get too much in the specific details. This is more or less there in place in case someone wants to ask a question about the, the integrations with messaging queue and retention, the data quality process, etc. And, and obviously the BI integration. But I think we can just skip to the to the final thoughts, go back to the innovation, uh, which is where we want to get, uh, and again, we are super lucky. Uh, and again, I cannot stress enough how lucky we are of having the, the, the more than customers, partners that we have, uh, that we are working in many very interesting scenarios uh, as you have in this slide. So from selecting the best cases to present to the court based on a cohort of many, many thousands of cases uh, to automatically classify the type of case or the or the settlement of a, of a case, how much is going to be so we can prepare the teams or detect whether we want to take the case or not. Uh, detections of footliers and documents, this kind of stuff. This is not science fiction. Uh, this is not something for the future. This is happening right now. And uh, this enables to transform your company. I think that the, by far the biggest transformations I'm seeing uh, for the last couple of years, uh, incredible stories of radical transformations of business uh, completely from a phone operated business, a business that only communicate with the customers using phone lines to a uh, business that communicate using apps uh, and then use the data of the apps, not just the, the actual values, but time taken to response and answer uh, how many times a customer has overridden a response so we see that this question might be tricky this kind of things this is happening this has been happening for quite some time in this space so uh super proud of our work but more importantly happy of of working with customers like you uh that enable us to, to be part of of this so monica back to you with with the next steps yeah, thank you and apologies for running over just a couple minutes. Um, thank you, Pablo, for all the insight. We could be discussing a few more days on this topic, um, but just some simple next steps. We're offering a complimentary strategy session and a data architecture workshop. What that means, um, the strategy session is basically one or two hours of ideation with Pablo to really understand your needs and outline, just brainstorm some solutions. Uh, now the data readiness assessment is an architecture design. It's a technical workshop. It's one or two days depending on you and your team. And it's really a deep dive into your current data state. Um, conduct a health check, understand your data state in terms of infrastructure, quality, integrity, and the session results into a set of actionable next steps and a solution design. Um, with that, I really thank you for your time. Um, any last questions? I've also p pasted my um, uh, personal email, so feel free to reach out directly. And just to answer the question in um, in the Q&A box, we will be sharing the recording after this webinar and you'll also receive a one pager just touching on a few of the projects we discussed and also a survey. We would really appreciate your feedback on on the webinar.
Thank you.